some way to put together those little fragments of the world in a way that transformed them into a picture. In the same way that you know, a poet uses the same dictionaries that the rest of us do, all the words are in there. All the words in the poem are there, they're in alphabetical order. So you can find them, and it's just a matter of taking a few of them and putting them in the right order and that's all there is to it. And so why is it that some lines of poetry, some sentences grasp us, you know, grip us, and we think, that's, that's right, that's true, whatever, the, I don't know quite what that means, but whatever it means, it's true. And a good picture does something like that. The best of Ansel's are part of our memory, part of our sense of what a picture might be made out of, and what it might look like, and what it might ultimately be about, which is the part we can't explain. His whole life would be a journey and an exploration, a search for meaning and order, for beauty and redemption, for contact with something larger and more lasting, for community, connection, and home. Born on the far western edge of the continent in the years following the close of the American frontier, he first encountered the awesome beauty of Yosemite Valley in the summer of 1916. From that day, he later wrote, my life has been colored and modulated by the great earth gesture of the Sierra. He would spend the rest of his life trying to capture on film the wild majesty of the American continent and the sublime and humbling exaltation of wilderness. Well, I think Ansel had a, a message in his art that was consistent throughout his career. And this is that the world is beautiful, that humanity is part of this larger world, that the concerns of the moment are part, but not separate from, a larger system of forces that connect us to all of creation. I can't, I can't verbalize on the internal meaning of pictures whatsoever. Some of my friends can at very mystical levels, but I... I prefer to say that if I feel something strongly, uh, I would make a photograph that would be the, the equivalent of what I saw and felt. When I'm ready to make a photograph, I think I quite obviously see in my mind's eye something that is not literally there in the true meaning of the word. I'm interested in expressing something which is built up from within rather than just extracted from without. When he photographed 
the wild landscape, especially in the, his own special home wild landscape in the, in the High Sierra and Yosemite. He had felt some consonance with that material that was very profound, very deep, very mystical, perhaps almost religious, although he would certainly object to that very strongly because he was not in any conventional sense a religious person. And then you try to find a way to make a picture that is consonant with your sense of your relationship to that experience. Not just a place, it's an experience, especially in Ansel's case, it has to do with that time, that moment, that evanescent, disappearing thing. For nearly 70 years, he would wander the great unoccupied spaces of the American West, photographing the landscape as the landscape itself changed all around him, and as the wild places of the continent dwindled and shrank and came under attack as never before. More than any other artist of the century, he would help transform the meaning of wilderness in America and change what people thought and felt about their own land. In the course of time, he himself would change as the rapturous visions that sustained him in his youth lost their power and began to fade. And as he came increasingly to resemble the avuncular, trusted elder statesman of his old age. But as a young man, he had seen something in the mountains of the Sierra Nevada, something that resonated far out into the landscape and down into the deepest recesses of his soul that would haunt him for the rest of his days and that he would spend his entire life trying to convey. He was born Ansel Easton Adams in the city of San Francisco in the winter of 1902, the only child of a once prosperous family on its way down in the world. His earliest memory was of lying in a pram, watching silent fingers of fog flowing east above his family's house, a lonely structure perched high above the dunes beyond the western edge of town, overlooking the waters of the Golden Gate. He always said he was formed by those early landscape experiences and where he was living. I mean, once you've lived a while in San Francisco, you can feel that fog kind of tiptoeing in where it changes the sounds and you can kind of gets into your bones. And Or when there's a glorious clear day and just, it's breathtakingly beautiful. And that was just part and parcel of Ansel. He was a lonely child in the gloomy troubled house by the sea, often ill, prone to fits of uncontrollable weeping and filled with a restless, surging energy he could not contain. Enrolled without success in one school after another, he often found it difficult even to remain seated at his desk. He was probably a very difficult kid to live with, and I think he drove his parents crazy. He was very um, full of energy and full of vitality and tremendous drive, but it was scattered. It was all over the place. Abandoning the idea of conventional schooling when the boy was only 12, his gentle, courtly father, Charles, poured all the love and energy he had into his difficult only son, arranging private tuition in algebra and Greek, and letting him roam for hours along the dunes and cliffs beyond the house, anywhere his boundless energy took him. His father just adored him, just adored him. But Ansel was so odd, but at the same time, he was so intelligent. With, with this zest for life. I mean, who, who wouldn't have been enchanted by this child? When Ansel was 13, he got him a year's pass to the World's Fair, the Panama Pacific Exposition. And that was a fabulous idea. Ansel went every single day, and he learned more there than he ever could have in a year at school. I don't think a lot of fathers then or now would have tolerated Ansel's unique character. And here was a father who not only tolerated it, but nurtured it. One afternoon in the fall of 1914, when he was still only 12, he began to find a focus for the chaotic feelings that welled up inside him. 
he was one of those geniuses and uh, sat down at the piano when he was just a kid and within a couple months without a teacher could could read music at sight piano was something that he instinctually fell absolutely in love with and yet it was very demanding the height of discipline and rigor I mean, practicing scales for hours at a time. Hard for any kid to do, but really hard for a kid who's kind of all scattered and a little bit uh, hyperactive. But he somehow focused all this chaotic energy. And by God, he did. I mean, he really focused it. In the years to come, despite the family's continuing financial troubles, Ansel's father would do everything he could to nurture the boy's unusual gift. Hiring the best instructors he could find and purchasing on installment a $6,000 Mason and Hamlin piano. Even when Ansel was 80 years old, he, he lowered his voice and spoke with reverence when he spoke about his father. And, uh, and he really understood what his father had done for him. I often wonder at the strength and courage my father had in taking me out of the traditional school situation and providing me with these extraordinary learning experiences. I'm certain he established the positive direction of my life that otherwise could have been confused and chaotic. I trace who I am and the direction of my development to those years of growing up in our house on the dunes, propelled especially by an internal spark, tenderly kept alive and glowing by my father. The World's Fair had broadened his horizons. Music had opened up a new world of beauty and order. But nothing could have prepared him for the stunning impact of another kind of music, which he first encountered in the summer of 1916, high in the mountains of the Sierra Nevada. When he was 14, his aunt gave him a book to read about Yosemite. And when he was ill, by the earliest major promoter of Yosemite, J.M. Hutchings, and it was a wonderful, romantic book about the Indians and this great Valhalla, this American place, a throne room of the gods, as it were. And Ansel was swept away by it. On June 1st, 1916, propelled by a ceaseless barrage of youthful pleadings and entreaties, the family set off for the first time on the two-day journey from San Francisco to Yosemite. Rumbling by train across the shimmering heat of the Central Valley, up through the parched brown foothills of the Sierra until they reached El Portal. Then on by open bus still higher, following the pristine waters of the Merced River ever deeper into the mountains. Until at length the river angled sharply to the east, and the splendor of Yosemite, Adams later wrote, burst upon us. There was, he said, light everywhere. A new era began for me. It was love at first sight. I don't think there's any place that hits you in the solar plexus the way the first time you come into Yosemite Valley. It's simply overwhelming. You're much closer to it. You're much more surrounded by it than you are in the Tetons or in the North Cascades. It's awesome. and. Oh, you put all those things together, and Ansel, it changed his life. It completely changed his life. I mean, it, it, it was, that was it. Bang. Yosemite became his home place. Shortly after arriving in the valley, his father presented him with a simple, fateful gift, a Kodak No. 1 box brownie camera in its own leather case with a strap. After being shown how the simple apparatus worked, he was off racing from one end of the valley to the other, shooting everything he saw. Domes, 
spires, streams, meadows, waterfalls, and cliffs. Endlessly trying, his friend Nancy Newhall later said, to pour into the magic little box his wonder and his ecstasy. Somehow he must capture this beauty, somehow convey this opening before him of a new heaven and a new earth. I think that what he found was a chance to break out of the bonds, both psychologically and physically, of his childhood. A kind of liberation from his own internal demons, as it were, the, the family tensions, the kind of cold and foggy environment of San Francisco. And out here was this giant playground. And so I think here was a chance to create another identity and away from his family, away from these illnesses. Each fall, back in San Francisco, he threw himself into the study of the piano, often practicing more than six hours a day. Each summer, he made his way back up to Yosemite, eager to explore the wondrous landscape and to work on his new hobby. Higher, the better. Higher up in the mountains, the better the work got. <laughs> that seems to me. His first photographs were little more than snapshots, aids to memory. Disappointed that they conveyed so little of what he had seen and felt at the moment of exposure, he set out to learn everything he could about the photographic process, teaching himself how to develop and print his own negatives, and experimenting with different approaches. In the summer of 1920, determined now to pursue a career as a concert pianist, he began searching the valley for a summer piano to practice on, and soon found one in the studio of a local painter named Harry Best, whose fair-haired 17-year-old daughter quickly became another reason for the tall, gangling 19-year-old to visit. On paper, Virginia was the perfect mate. She loved poetry. She was studying to be a classical singer. So she was involved in music and literature, all the things that Ansel cared most deeply about and she could hike. She could out hike Ansel, I bet, at that time. It was a very long courtship and off again, on again. Several times Ansel gave up, uh, gave his life to music again, which didn't include uh, getting married and then they'd get back together again. Each summer, he ventured farther and farther up into the rugged high country beyond Yosemite Valley sometimes on his own, and sometimes with members of the Sierra Club, the wilderness group John Muir had founded 30 years before. Long days of climbing and hiking that began before dawn and often ended well after dark, making pictures when he could, and wandering, he wrote, in translucent unity with the world and sky. Late one morning in the summer of 1923, Wandering amidst the harsh and bleakly beautiful high country east of the valley, he came as close as he ever would to capturing in words the soaring emotions that sometimes came over him in the high mountains. I was climbing the long ridge west of Mount Clark. It was one of those mornings where the sunlight is burnished with a keen wind and long feathers of cloud move in a lofty sky. The silver light turned every blade of grass and every particle of sand into a luminous metallic splendor. There was nothing, however small, that did not clash in the bright wind, that did not send arrows of light through the glassy air. I was suddenly arrested in the long crunching path up the ridge by an exceedingly pointed awareness of the light. The moment I paused, the full impact of the mood was upon me. I saw more clearly than I've ever seen before or since the minute detail of the grasses, the small flotsam of the forest, the motion of the high clouds streaming above the peaks. I dreamed that for a moment time stood quietly, and the vision became but the shadow 
of an infinitely greater world. And I add within the grasp of consciousness, a transcendental experience. Ansel Adams. He would spend the rest of his life trying to capture on film the quicksilver light he saw that morning and the sense it conveyed of a deeper truth and meaning. I think one could risk saying that in a broad way, it's a quasi-religious sense of identification with the landscape. The quality of the experience, I think, one might call ecstatic. Do you know Bernini, St. Teresa? The same kind of nervous insubstantiality, this flickering, flame-like, ecstatic quality. Ecstasy, I mean, it's, it's outside yourself. It's an experience of, um, I mean, I think might, one might actually, for a change, really use the word epiphany <laughs> uh, without forcing it too much. For seven more years, he would continue to struggle to define himself as an artist. Still convinced that music was the higher art form, but increasingly torn between music and photography, San Francisco and Yosemite. Dear Virginia, if you only knew the yearning to get into the mountains that fills me these days. Music is wonderful, but the musical world is bunk. So much petty doings, so much pose and insincerity and distorted values. I find myself looking back on the golden days in Yosemite with supreme envy. I think I came closer to really living then than at any other time of my life because I was closer to elemental things. I love you immensely at this moment and will be so glad to see you again. I am coming to Yosemite sometime in the spring, or bust. Ansel. They were married nine months later, in the parlor of Virginia's father's house in Yosemite. The bride in black, the groom in a tie, plus fours and tennis shoes. He was 26 years old. In the end, it was Yosemite, perhaps, more than anything else, that had brought Adams back to Virginia and photography, along with a remarkable transformation that by the spring of 1927 had begun to take place in his photographic work itself. Within four weeks of his ecstatic letter to Virginia, he had returned to the valley, where on a brilliant Sunday afternoon in early April, high up on the western flank of the great granite face of Half Dome, he made a series of pivotal photographs. Among them one, his friend Nancy Newhall later said, that even then spoke to beholders like a trumpet. As haunting and as crystal clear as his vision on the slopes of Mount Clark four years earlier. In a day in April, he set out to hike up to what's called the diving board, a little tiny, tiny point of granite that, from which you can look up, right up at the sheer face of Half Dome above you. On the way up, he takes some pictures. He stops and takes a picture out towards Glacier Point, and he takes a picture of Virginia, and he takes a picture of Mount Clark. So by the time he gets up to the diving board, which is the purpose of this exercise, he only has two glass plates left. And he sets up the camera, and he puts the first glass plate, he removes the slide, and he, he carefully composes on the ground glass, and he clicks the shutter, and he suddenly thinks, oh, the picture I just took when I print it is not going to translate, communicate to people what I'm feeling as I stand here. He was there, it was the last plate of the day, he'd had a difficult climb, and suddenly it came to him that maybe the idea, the, the, the sense of what the experience was like would be more faithfully rendered if he put on the heavy red Rattan A filter which would radically 
darken the sky and make, in fact, the sky darker than the face of the cliff. And by George, it worked. And it gives you more power and drama and majesty. It's all the things he's feeling about this incredible granite monolith in front of him. It came to represent a moment when he had made a great leap forward in terms of the notion of pre-visualizing what the print should look like and thinking about how to, how to produce his negative in a way that would achieve that, that pre-visualized idea. It was a turning point. For the first time, he later said, he had found a way to make a mountain look how it feels, a huge monumental thing. By 1930, he and Virginia had settled into a new house and studio, right next door to Ansel's parents in San Francisco, where he threw himself headlong into his career as a photographer. Well, I think Ansel and Virginia were as good a match as Ansel could have hoped to find. And the fact that the relationship was not perfect was more Ansel's fault than hers. He was, like many artists, very absorbed in his work and in his own quest for greatness. And she had to deal with that. And I think she dealt with it very well. She was sort of the unsung hero. Uh, my mom had the business in Yosemite. She inherited it from her father after he passed away in the 30s. And that enabled them to live and Ansel to have more time to do the creative work. Commercial jobs were very important, but her support financially allowed him to do a lot of things that he might not otherwise have been doing. The next five years would prove to be the most crucial and formative period of his entire career. In 1930, he was barely a, a real photographer, a full-time photographer, a recognized photographer. And five years, six years later, he was one of the better known serious photographers in the United States. Now, it was a small community in those days, but there was this sort of meteoric recognition. Gradually, he said, my photographs began to mean something in themselves. They became records of experiences, as well as of places. It seems to me, his best friend Cedric Wright wrote in the summer of 1932, that your prints have improved like hell in the last year. This is the first time they have seemed on a par with your best writing. Six months later, in the winter of 1933, he traveled east to New York for the first time in his life to meet the great photographer Alfred Stieglitz. In the stillness of his gallery on Madison Avenue, the uncompromising old master silently perused the portfolio of prints Adams had brought with him. Not once, but twice, without uttering a word. Then carefully closed and retied it with a bow. These, he said simply, are some of the finest photographs I have ever seen. Alfred Stieglitz meant the greatest in art. To be accepted by Albert Stieglitz was to be accepted as a great artist. And that's what Ansel aspired to be. The landscape photographs he now began to create were unlike any that had ever been made before. Those pictures looked unlike other pictures. If you wanted to try to define the content of it, I think you'd have to say it has to do with his appreciation of the landscape as something that's not permanent, but evanescent. Always in the process of becoming something else. They're always something defined by the transient quality of the light, by the weather. Ansel's technique was designed to solve the very difficult problem that his sensibility required. If you're going to photograph the mountain as weather, as opposed to geology, you gotta have a better technique. In Ansel's best photographs, you have the sense you could identify the temperature, the relative humidity, 
the hour of the day, the day of the month, because that's what they're about. He's not doing this for nothing. He's not doing this to show off. That's the nature of his subject matter. It requires that he be able to describe the quality of the air. There's something in Ansel's work that is almost gothic. It's this tracery. It's this uh, shimmering tracery. It's not really substantial. It's like a movie screen. Mm -hmm. Flickers like that. It's all this surface ornament. Very vital and animistic and never still. Shimmering, shaking. I never met anyone who worked as hard as he did, never took a day off, never took a vacation, ever. He simply worked seven days a week, every day of the year, every year, even when he was 80, he was still doing that. The only time he would take a day off is if he was recovering from a hangover, and then that was not infrequent. But his own career was really precarious economically. Well. Ansel had just begun to mature as an artist when the Great Depression struck. He was achieving recognition, some degree of success, at a time when a lot of the foundations of the style he had developed were being questioned. As the impact of the Depression caused artists around the world to reassess the motivations for their work. What am I doing? Why am I doing it? Why? What's the point of making beautiful pictures at a time of national, international catastrophe? Well, he and Edward Weston were both criticized because they weren't photographing the social crisis of the 1930s. And Cartier-Bresson said that the world is going to pieces and Adams and Weston are photographing rocks and trees. And Ansel was very stung by this criticism. He believed that photography should be, his photography was about art. He felt that documentary photography, unless it was practiced at an extremely high level, was propaganda. And he wasn't interested in that. He, was, he wasn't trying to send a message. First of all, at that point, people didn't think the environment was a terribly important issue. They thought unemployment and the Dust Bowl and hunger and social injustice were the issues. Now, ironically, it turns out that one of the great social human issues of the 20th century has certainly been the environment. And Ansel was way ahead of the curve on understanding that. The feeling for the land, and therefore environmentalism, is an integral part of the photographs. And he never set out to take a picture for an environmental purpose, but he could go out and take a picture and show you how he felt about this incredible landscape. And then it could be used in many different ways. But he said it had to come from his soul and his heart and his spirit, and it couldn't be imposed from the outside. But I truly believe that he was an environmentalist down to his toenails. Just every little bit of him was all about the beauty of nature and the need to keep it inviolate for generations to come. The most turbulent, intense, and harrowing year of Ansel Adams' life began with a stunning triumph. By the third week of January, 1936, he was on his way east again, bound for Washington where he hoped to convince Congress to have the vast Kings Canyon wilderness, southeast of Yosemite, set aside as a national park. Along the way, he stopped off in New York to show Alfred Stieglitz his latest photographic work. He was stunned when the old man offered him a one-man show at his gallery that fall, the first photographer to be so honored in more than four years. It was one of the highest points of his entire career, Everything seems to come to him who waits, he wrote Virginia. 
here he was in his mid-30s with now two children, a developing but hardly flourishing career as a photographer. And along comes an opportunity from Alfred Stieglitz to have a one-man show at An American Place, the ultimate venue for any photographer of the day. And he threw himself into this project. Back in California, with not one but three exhibits to prepare for in the fall, he plunged into a maelstrom of work. With the assistance of a dark-haired 22-year-old one-time model named Patsy English, whom he had hired to help out with the avalanche of printing. The show at the Stieglitz Gallery is in the fall of 36, and all that summer in the High Sierra, he's hiking and taking pictures. And when he got back from the summer, then he started printing in earnest, and I think it was white hot in the dark room. And his assistant, Patsy English, said she remembers that he would say, I've got to make this, it's just got to be fantastic because it's going to be at Stieglitz's gallery. And sometimes he'd show her a print in the tray, still wet, and he'd say, what do you think? And she'd say, oh, I think maybe you need to do a little more. What, is there more? So he'd keep going. And so those prints for that show, it's a body of work that's absolutely incredible. He wasn't sure how much was Stieglitz inspiring him and how much Patsy was inspiring him because at the end of the day, he did know, whatever it was, that these were, in his mind, the best prints he'd ever made. And at the same time, he had the, the one great love experience of his whole life. He fell deeply in love and had a very intense affair, although I don't think it was sexual with Patsy English. But it was the absolutely great love of his life. The prints he made that summer were some of the most inspired and luminous of his career. But week after week, the physical and emotional strain of the work and of his increasingly conflicted feelings for Patsy and Virginia began to take a toll until the stress had become all but unbearable. So he pushed on through the summer, working frenetically, he got the show ready, brought it to New York, and it was a great success. And in the wake of that success, Ansel fell apart. The fundamental reason was just pure physical exhaustion. He'd been working himself just beyond the breaking point. But there was a psychological component as well. You know, he had, was just not able to deal anymore with the complexity of his life. And I think that he had this sense of feeling trapped within a whole set of expectations, of responsibilities, of just a set of things that he couldn't deal with, and this was the only way he could escape. When he couldn't pull it off, when he couldn't go through with, you know, getting a divorce and leaving his family and, and going off, uh, he had a nervous breakdown and wound up in the hospital. And it was sort of like, pop! This, this period of his life, the, his 30s, his early 30s, and the early 30s of, of the century uh, kind of came slamming down to an end. For 18 months, he wrestled with depression and a devastating inner emptiness struggling to come to terms with what had happened. And he finally realizes he can't overturn things, even though he'd like to, romantically. And, and I think it was hard for him, but he could really see that that was, he had made the right decision. And he couldn't make the decision to leave because it wouldn't have been the right thing to do. And so he stayed. And you could argue, what would have happened if he'd left? I can't say. He stayed, and he was proud to have been married for 50 years to Virginia. He was really proud, and that his children and his grandchildren and great-grandchildren, it, it made, gave him great happiness. She was his ballast, his rock, his anchor. He always felt, whenever he got east of the Rockies, that his 
His life force was slowly being sapped and taken away. So he would come home depleted, but he would always come home to Virginia and come home to Yosemite, and he would heal again. In the end, work on the mountains saved him. He was still struggling to find his way in the spring of 1937, when a wealthy businessman named Walter Starr asked him to take on a special project, a book of photographs that he hoped would serve as a memorial to his young son, Peter, who had died in a fall while climbing alone amidst the craggy spires of the minarets. He got very involved in this book project that was one of the most beautiful books he ever did, Sierra Nevada, the John Muir Trail. And uh, it was a limited edition, only 500 copies, but an absolutely magnificent book. It took several years. There was a lot of difficulty getting the printing right. It was very definitely the most important work he had done as an artist until then, as far as, as books. Sierra Nevada, the John Muir Trail, was a photographic masterpiece. Here, in bright light and rare clarity, is to be found the very essence of the Sierra, one man said. And it also was influential in the effort to create uh, Kings Canyon National Park. He actually took many of the photographs to Washington to lobby the Senate for the Sierra Club, and, and he sent a copy to Harold Ickes, the Secretary of the Interior, who was a great fan of his, and Ickes took it over to President Roosevelt and used it to persuade Roosevelt to support Kings Canyon as a national park, and Roosevelt liked it so much he insisted on keeping it, so <laughs> Ansel had to send another copy to Ickes. On March 4th, 1940, President Franklin Roosevelt signed into law a bill officially incorporating Kings Canyon into the national park system. I realize the head of the National Park Service later wrote Adams that a silent but most effective voice in the campaign was your own book. So long as that book is in existence, it will go on justifying the park. In the pages of Adams' exquisite volume, art and politics had come together, and both had triumphed. For 15 more years, he would continue to work at the very height of his powers as a photographer and an artist. As the Depression waned and World War came, and the war itself served to accelerate a crucial shift in his photography, away from the lyrical intimacy of his early work towards grander, more dramatic themes. Too old at 40 for military service, he began work in the fall of 1941 on an ambitious series of murals for the Department of the Interior. Epic images of immense size and technical difficulty, portraying an American landscape as if touched by the hand of God, one man later said. The first thing he does, he drops the horizon. If you look at landscapes from the 20s and the very early 30s, it's always a high horizon and you're kind of locked out. But when he gets into the early 40s, he drops that horizon and suddenly you've got these limitless spaces and this incredible feeling of space. And that's when I think he's at his best when you just can kind of lose yourself in an Ansel Adams sky. Driving through northern New Mexico, late one afternoon in early November 1941, he came across a sleepy village in the last light of day and made one of the most powerfully haunting photographs of his career. Well, Moonrise Hernandez, I think, is probably one of the most famous photographs in the 20th century and continuing on to, into this new century. And it's one of those examples of what Ansel liked to call chance favoring the prepared mind, that he was ready. And even though he didn't have a light meter or couldn't dig it out of his case in time, he was able to, uh, to successfully get this on film with one shot. All I remember is that we came to a very sudden stop and it was one of these hurry, 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 get out, get the tripod, get the camera, this sort of thing. I see a wonderful picture. And then he took this picture, Moonrise, 
the, the one and only picture that he got uh, is the one that we know today. Uh, within minutes or seconds of that picture, the sun set and lost the light on the gravestones that were in the foreground. He manipulated the work tremendously in the darkroom. He always said the negative is the equivalent of the composer's score, and the print is the equivalent of the conductor's performance. And the same piece of Mozart is conducted differently, performed differently by different orchestras, different conductors. And Ansel performed his own negatives differently. It was very important to Ansel to convey his inner feelings about the subject. And, you know, he'd put the negative in the enlarger and every printing experience was a new, essentially, rebirth of the image. Sometimes he printed things, you know, very somber. Sometimes he would print things light and airy. But every time he tried to be faithful to how he felt about that scene. It was like a ballet, watching him in the dark room, jumping around and, and dodging and burning and, and, and saying, I want the sky to, to be richer. And he really worked them over. And often it would take him a whole day before he got one print from a negative right. Once he did that, he could make more prints, but it was, uh, it was real, real labor. I don't know, half or 40% of the creative process occurred in the dark room. At some point in the late 50s, the great creative urge began to dissipate. Certainly after the mid to late 50s, he made very few photographs of real consequence. Whether he felt he'd said it or done it, he continued to make photographs, but the drive was gone. He was uh, 61 years old at the time of the exhibition, and Many artists have much, much shorter periods of great productivity. If you look at the few late pictures he made late in his life, Moon and Half Dome, El Capitan Winter Sunrise, oh my gosh, those are two of his 12 best pictures. And he made them on the spur of the moment when he happened to be in Yosemite with a camera, which shows he could still do it. And so I am convinced that the reason he didn't was he was always worried about the wolf at the door and money. He was nearing 70 when the financial security that had eluded him all his life materialized at last in the form of an enterprising one-time graduate student in forestry named Bill Turnage, whom Adams had met in the spring of 1970 while lecturing at Yale. Taking over the management of Adams' affairs, Turnage swiftly turned the Ansel Adams archive into a multi-million dollar business. And Adams himself into a popular icon and the first mass-marketed fine arts photographer in the world. Ansel, in his last years, became cross between uh, one's favorite uncle and uh, Smokey the Bear. But that wasn't the real artist. Uh, I think that was somebody who, who had come to recognize that his, uh, that his best work as a photographer was, was behind him and uh, was proceeding to be an extraordinarily valuable uh, member of society as an educator, as a conservationist, as a spokesman for a lot of things that many of us regard as highly important. But that wasn't the greatest answer. In my view, the greatest Ansel was Ansel the artist, and that was that Ansel was operating at full steam for more than 20 years, which is very good, very good for an artist. You know, he spent the last two decades of his life in a very, very productive way. Um, first of all, uh, making prints of many photographs he'd been unable to print when he was racing around doing jobs and so on. He created a, a whole series of books which was tremendously important to him because he wanted people to see his work. 
He was also at his most influential from the standpoint of the environmental movement. He was, he was the one American environmentalist who could meet with the president just by picking up the telephone. He was very, very active lecturing, going around the country, both on, on particularly on photography, more, more than on the environment. So he was flat out. Even when he was 80, he was working 12, 14 hours a day, seven days a week, and traveling constantly, and very, very productive. Year after year, the honors and accolades poured in. In the fall of 1979, he was honored with a retrospective exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and featured on the cover of Time magazine. One year later, at a gala ceremony at the White House, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor. Ever considered what would be a, a proper epitaph for Ansel Adams? Well, I think Alfred Stevens' epitaph, he told me he wanted that after the ideal. It said, here lies Alfred Stieglitz. He lived for better or for worse, but he's dead for good. <laughs> In the end, even Adam's phenomenal reserves of energy began to fail. On the evening of April 22nd, 1984, his heart gave out in a hospital near his home in Carmel Highlands. He was 82 years old. Six months after Adam's death, in an extraordinary tribute to the great photographer and environmentalist, Congress set aside an immense tract of wild land southeast of Yosemite and named it the Ansel Adams Wilderness. One year later, in August 1985, a remote windswept peak in the very heart of the High Sierra was officially named Mount Ansel Adams. That would have thrilled him more than anything. The fact that Congress created the wilderness, named it after him, and that it was his absolutely favorite part of, of the world. And so, uh, I think he would have, uh, I think he would have really loved that. Oh, I think it's so appropriate. Uh, I can't think of a better tribute to him. This particular site with that mountain in an area that he especially loved, that means a lot. <laughs> 